I had initially planned to say some things that I'm going to still pretend I'm going to say and say part of, but certainly there are some things that have changed um, in terms of what I'm thinking about as being terribly important to us today. Um, I was here wanting to talk about changing the world <coughs> and the importance of realizing that we're not changing a static world, we're in fact changing a dynamic world, which is to say that part of part of the effort, which is like how you're going to get something to start moving, you don't even have to worry about because it's moving anyway, it's changing. And so the real question, how do you direct the change taking place in the world? But something changed. <laughs> There, there was an election this week, and I don't think I had to convince anybody that the world is changing. <laughs> you know, uh, there's some pretty interesting new things that are taking place that I imagine caught some people by surprise. Uh, y'all can admit it. How many of y'all voted for Trump? I'm just curious. Oh, come on. Okay, a lot. You know, that's what they said during the, that's what happened during the polling. The people who voted for Trump. <laughs> Didn't want to tell anybody, so it's like, well, you know, he didn't have any chance at all. It's, it's okay. Um, so, what we have just witnessed, I think, is the utter and complete proof of the massive failure of public education in the United States. And that's kind of almost humorous, but it's not. I mean, how public education in the United States has failed is that not only it's presented a false history, which has created a ridiculous, false, triumphant narrative that ends up leading people to not at all be able to understand the actual events in their lives, that leaves people willing and capable because critical thinking skills are almost completely ignored to hear and fall for almost anything, and that's what just happened. So public education is really, really screwed up. And so a huge challenge for all of us at some point is to figure out how can we actually create opportunities to tell truth uh, so that people are capable of understanding the world that they live in and making realistic, rational choices about it. <clears throat> the general orientation that uh, we come from in the Fund for Democratic Communities is something we call our RAD orientation, where we talk about the relationship between resistance, advocacy, and doing things for ourselves. And um, the, the issue of resistance is, is pretty clear. That when something ugly happens to you, when something powerful is pushing you away, rather than letting it crush you, you need to resist it. That's what you gotta do. That doesn't change. It's always the case. Don't forget to resist. Oh, you die. You go away. The question of advocacy is something a lot of people are excited about, which is, that the idea that their power concentrated in some places and what you want to do is direct that power in such a way that's going to make a difference to you and the communities that you care about. So you advocate the things that you need those forces of power to do. You advocate for the resources that you need to come in. And that's important, and you should always do that whenever you get a chance. But the third thing that's important is that we the people have the capacity to be the power in our own lives to determine the things that will meet our needs and elevate the quality of life in the communities that we care about. And so this possibility of doing things for ourselves, <coughs> I think is central. And think of how often you hear about organizations who tell you what they do, and they do resistance and advocacy work, social justice organizations, without ever talking about, and we try to figure out how to build the future that we want. It has become evidently clear in the last couple of weeks that we will have to build the future that we want because the likelihood, well, first of all, resistance is one of these things you get into and you always have to do it, and if that's all you do, that's what you'll keep doing. The likelihood that we will advocate for all of the things we want and likely get them if we're nice enough, you know, is something that has, is becoming a dream. And the fact that we're going to have to do a whole lot of stuff for ourselves is a core reality I think we all face. And we, as people interested in cooperation, in cooperatives, have a kind of leg up on folk who are wondering what in the world are we going to do, because a lot of us are already doing the things that we need to be doing, and what we need to do is do a lot more of them and do it better. 
the basic problem we have, I'm going to try to state it as simply as I can. The basic problem we have is that everything that we need in order to live is owned by some few people who can legally restrict our access to it and cause us to die. All right? And by legally, I mean that they have the support of the structure of a state government apparatus to enforce their private ownership of all of the things that we need in order to stay alive. So, you know, back in the day, there were commons, there were places where people went to graze their cattle, to hunt, to fish, to scratch the dirt and grow potatoes, uh, to grow corn, to grow the things they need. But these common areas have been enclosed and are no longer available widely unless we ask the person who owns it, can we use it? So somebody stepped foot on some land and said, I claim this land. And so the second person that stepped foot on the same land did the same thing the old one did, but just a little bit, a minute later, owes rent. <laughs> All right? So this process of claiming and owning is a process that is so, it's made to seem like it's natural and inevitable, but it's not. I mean, for tens of thousands of years, people had relationship to the earth where the idea of owning the earth was, I would just <laughs> own the earth, we use the earth, we eat off the earth, we need the earth that provides us life and livelihood, but you can't own it. We didn't make it, we didn't put it here, it's here for us, food is here. You know, just pick it off the tree. You all ever see that thing that um, Louis C.K. did? <laughs> he said, food all over the ground, just pick it up. He said, <laughs> You know, why, uh, what, is, what is this? You're getting caught up in this. You know, things were here. Things have been provided for us. And this, this nature has been enclosed. It is now owned. And by owned, I mean that there are people who have the capacity to restrict our access to it with the force of violence and death behind enforcing uh, that. <coughs> They utilize this power of owning everything to then insist that all of the surplus production that people are able to do with these resources and with the accumulated things from the past now belongs to the same few people that own stuff just so that they can increase their ownership of more stuff and have more control over everyone's life. This is the problem we had. This is the problem we have now, and this is the problem we had when the Democrats were still in power, quite frankly. All right. So what might have happened didn't happen. <laughs> there was an election that took place. And my, my guess is that the job of changing what I just described was a job that we had before the election. It is a job that we'll have after the election now. And I think what might have happened is, had the election gone a different way, there have been a lot of people that rather than thinking about this terrible and incredible incredibly difficult job we have of changing these relationships where the very life of people here in this country and around the world is in the hands of people who own and don't care anything about us and just want to increase their power. Rather than us focusing on that, we would have probably been celebrating, wow, we won, okay? But we, we, we didn't, and that job is still out in front of us. And so let's figure out how to make the most out of understanding it and engaging in it. So this system, as I was saying, is already changing. And part of how it changes is, is caught up in the, <clears throat> in the essential contradiction of the system itself. It's, a, it's, it's the system following its own logic that requires it to be changing. Because what happens, again, is that all of us are capable of being productive. We can all produce more than we need for ourselves. All of this excess is then accumulated by a handful of folk. They use it so that they can increase their ownership and control and access and accumulation. And after a while, there's no one to buy the stuff that is produced by those of us who produce it. This surplus is produced. And in fact, if you think about it, even short of that happening, the amount that we get paid out of our involvement in the production process is that which it, it takes for us to reproduce ourselves. It's basically what it takes to keep us alive and us having a, a, a community that continues to produce people. There's a friend of mine now, he's a 93-year-old political economist, he wrote an incredible book called The Principles of Black Political Economy, which is really, it is that and more, 
because it talks about the nature of political economy itself. And he basically makes it clear that there are two things that take place in any economy. And that's producing people and producing food. Now, the reason why that is true is because if you have a community that doesn't produce any more people, after one generation, what happens? It's gone. <laughs> All right, that's the end of that short story. If you have a community that doesn't produce food, what happens? It's gone. Everybody starves to death after a while. Might not even live a whole generation if there's no food being produced. So you have a section of the world that is about producing food and a section that produce, and it doesn't produce any more people. Then there's a section where people are produced and nurtured and, and trained and educated, and it doesn't produce any food. And these sections communicate with each other, they talk to each other. That's the kind of the, the nature of the economy. But what happens is the amount of money that goes out in wages and stuff to the, to the community where, where people are being produced is never enough to buy all of this stuff out of the economy where food and other things are being produced. Because again, people are capable of producing more than they need. And wh who buys this extra? Who converts this extra production back into money so that people can start the cycle again? Capitalists have to buy it. So the biggest part of an economic crisis isn't that the consumers who buy food and stuff, you know, quit buying because people who buy food keep buying. Uh, but it is the capitalists don't think that there's any possibility to expand right now, and so they quit buying. And you have all these warehouses full of stuff that are largely capital goods that can't be sold because there's no one trying to expand the economy, economy anymore. But I just want you to understand that, that this, is a, this is inherent in the nature of the system. This isn't something that is adjustable. It happens over and over again. And sometimes it happens in small cycles. Sometimes it happens in bigger cycles. And quite frankly, at some point, there are confluence where the big cycles and the small cycles happen at the same time. And you have an intense kind of crisis from which it's very, very difficult to get out of. And that's, that's kind of the period we're in. We have something that someone had the nerve to call a jobless recovery. Now, what in the hell is that? <laughs> what recovered? I mean, all of the things I care about are people's capacity to meet their needs and elevate the quality of life, which comes for many people off of the wages they receive. And if that didn't recover, I'm supposed to be happy about the capitalists are back into the cycle of making more and more profit and gaining more and more control? I don't think so. But anyhow, um, this crisis can't stay this way. I mean, it, it can't just keep on being stagnant and jobless recoveries and less and less people working and stuff. Um, so there's going to be a, what uh, this guy, Emmanuel Wallerstein, talks about uh, world system and world system crisis. He talks about there's going to be a bifurcation. There's a splitting into two. And either we're going to move toward a more just, humane, democratic world that begins to care again about the commonwealth of people, or we're going to move into an incredibly repressive sy system where control becomes more and more strictly militaristic uh, and violent in order to, through coercion, force people back to en engage in these uh, productive processes um, that don't really meet, fully meet their needs. So this bifurcation is happening now Actually, it's a worldwide phenomenon. If you think about it all over the world, where there are austerity programs and more and more repressive regimes coming to power, and now we have one, OK? So we can join Greece and uh, a number of places in, in Latin America. I believe Argentina recently has moved to the right. Um, there are threats of motion to the right in Venezuela. So we can join them in terms of figuring out what is it you do with a really repressive regime right here at home that you got to figure out how to stop them from the austerity measures where they essentially want to coerce things. But at the same time that's happening, we are happening. All right? And we do not take lightly the fact that we are an important part of this equation. And quite frankly, I want to say this, and I'm going to say it a bunch of times before I finish. We can't lose. Okay? We can't lose. <clears throat> And when I say we can't lose, I mean three slightly different things. First of all, I mean we can't afford to lose. <laughs> it's like we can't lose, like no, we can't lose because no, we can't, we cannot, obviously we can't afford to lose and be repressed in that way. But secondly, I mean 
we can't lose because in some sense history is on our side. Uh, one of the quotes that Martin Luther King got from somebody else who, if I remember right, was an abolitionist who most people have forgotten, but I did remember his name, but I, I have forgotten. <laughs> it's something about the moral arc of the universe is, is uh, long, but it bends toward justice. So in that sense, I would like to say that we can't lose. And the third sense that I would like to say it is that we have the power. We can't lose. We actually have the capacity for building the unity among people that is stronger than the forces that are aligned against us as soon as we put that power together. Now, does that mean we can be passive and we won't? No, that's, that's not what that means. That doesn't mean we can't do, we can just do nothing and we will achieve this incredible victory just sitting around waiting for history to work itself out because we're part of history. We're part of the consciousness. We're part of the, the capacity to move things forward. Does that mean that we can do stupid stuff and everything will be just as well? No, not really. When you do stupid stuff, you actually have the capacity to make some things work, worse. So you need to really pay a lot of attention to making sure that you do the very best that you can by not falling into what the public education system would have taught you how to do, uh, quite frankly. So you can't do stupid stuff and make things better. Now, does that mean we can't make mistakes, large and small? No, it doesn't mean that either, because quite frankly, we will make mistakes. Um, and we can play blame games after mistakes are made, or we can try to learn as much as we can from the situation that we're in and figure out the path forward. And I think that that's very much the situation that we're in now. I have seen so many people posting to all kind of social media stuff about like, whose fault it is that Donald Trump got elected president. Incredibly complex <laughs> set of things interacting with each other. And so some people's response is only to try to figure out who to point the finger. Well, if you didn't vote for Hillary, then you can't protest now. And I thought, yes, I can. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't have, I, and I'm not, I'm not saying bad things about people who did vote for Hillary or, I'm not gonna say bad things today about all the people who voted for Trump. All of them are not bad people. And that's a very, very important thing in terms of building the power that we're gonna need to change the system. It's important to remember that. But certainly, how you vote, you haven't given up your right to protest ever. I mean, you know, that, that if you have that ability to do on the basis that there's something that you see, you think ought to be in a different way, then you should build a protest about it. And that is not given up by you not having done other things that other people wanted you to do at some particular point in time. Just not. So just do what you got to do. Um, but the big question that we have to figure out is how are we going to build the kinds of coalitions that need to be built in order to build the power that we need? We need to figure out who is building them and become a part of that. And by that, and that's where it's really important to me to remember that all of the people that voted for stupid, they may have been acting stupid in voting for stupid, but they're not bad people. And quite frankly, they have real needs and interests that are not being met by the current system because the current system is incapable of meeting the needs and interests of the vast majority of the people. That's not even a capacity that it has. And all that is wrong with them is not simply that they are racist, even though I'm certain that some of them are indeed racist, maybe many. But, that's, but still, this, this system doesn't even meet the need of racists, all right? So the real question is, how do we get all of the people for whom this system is incapable of meeting their needs to recognize that it is this system that is incapable of meeting their needs, not people coming across from Mexico, not Muslims, halfway around the world or on our borders or in our state houses, which they, they're about to start finding Muslims everywhere. Um, and I, there'll be ISIS members that found in this audience probably if they were to look carefully enough. Um, but no, that's not the problem. This system is incapable of meeting those needs and consequently the system has to be examined and it has to be transformed and it has to be transformed at its root which is tied up in an understanding of those property relationships I would just describe that make it legal for somebody to own that which everybody else needs in order to live. Do you understand that when, when somebody controls your life that way, that they have almost re-enslaved you? 
And that's the system that we have to transform, and we have to examine these systems of ownership and elevate those systems of common ownership, collective ownership, that go toward recreating commons, recreating common spaces in which we are all capable of accessing the resources we need in order to elevate, meet our needs, and, and again, elevate the quality of life. Um, A few years ago, I did something. Uh, it was almost tongue in cheek, but then it really wasn't. And the more I've shared it with people, the more some folks realize that it has some utility. Uh, and I'm going to share it with you all today. Uh, I decided to, to create a religion. And the reason I decided to create a religion was because the sacred texts and, and the other religions that I knew about were all too long. I mean, there were these thick books, and I knew people who would tell me that every word in the Bible was true, and I knew for a fact that they hadn't read it. And so <laughs> I'm going, I need something simpler than this. So I came up with what the, the name I'll share for it today is just kind of the church, of the, a, a church for the latter day. And it starts with this preamble. Remember that all memory and all truth is selective and incomplete including whatever is true here. Starts out with a touch of humility. But there's a statement of beliefs. I struggle to avoid all dogma. I believe in the changing and consistent contradictory harmony of the complex emergent universe and little else. I believe in loving and being loved. I believe in making and appreciating beauty. I believe that seeking the truth by questioning everything is the holiest of activities. I oppose violence, including violence against me. I believe in finding the good everywhere it can be found. I believe in creating good whenever possible. I believe in the strengthening of the weak and exploited so that they can do for themselves. I believe in taking away the unearned, undeserved strength and advantage of exploiters so that they can rejoin the human mass as equals rather than as selfish superiors. And I believe in creating the world I want to live in. Then it talks about opportunities. All this, will fit on, all this fits on one page. It talks about opportunities. Opportunities can be found all around us. When there is justice, we have the opportunity to grow and prosper. When there is great injustice, we have the opportunity to fight for a better world. Our moment is this moment. There is always something important to do. And in terms of moments, in every moment, there is meaning. And in every moment, great beauty can be created. Talking about meaning, we need not look for meaning in things or situations. We create meaning rather than find it. On freedom, true freedom is not so much about, make, about making choices as it is about creating the choices that are made available. And two more parts, democracy that the essence of democracy is less in finding opportunities to register our opinions than in creating opportunities to think together with others, to form our ideas of how the world should be and how we should behave in the world. And finally, on sharing, leave for others as much as you take for yourself. Share with others what you are able to share. Be as responsive in consideration of others' desires as you would wish others to be in consideration of yours. Live so that all others could live like you and we could have a happy world. No more than this should be asked of anyone. No more than this is needed. OK. I actually can read that and live it every day. And I know what's in it. <laughs> And again, they're more complex things, and I'm not being critical of other faith traditions. But I was asked once, like, what do you believe in? And I used to talk about what I didn't believe. And I realized you can't explain what you are on the basis of what you don't believe. And that's kind of crazy. Like, they don't even have a word for people who don't believe in Santa Claus. There isn't, right? <laughs> so I need to talk about what I do believe. And, and that's kind of it. And I live it every day. And the thing about opportunities is really, really important, because I know some people who are despondent right now, who feel like, you know, the world just collapsed on them sometimes early Wednesday morning 
when they looked at the result of the election and found out that something they thought unthinkable had taken place. And I want to say again that opportunities are all around us, and so the question is to identify what are the new opportunities that have been created, and how are we going to engage those opportunities to build the world that we need? That's as simple a question as it is, and it would have been the question anyway, and it remains the question. Um, I was, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, it was the weekend of October 21st. I was in Abbeville, South Carolina. Abbeville, South Carolina, 100 years ago, on October 21st, 1916, a man named Anthony P. P. Crawford, who was a wealthy uh, African-American resident of Abbeville, had 400 and some acres of land, grew cotton. He was trying to sell his cotton seed to, the, uh, uh, to a store there. And the guy offered him a price that was such an insult to him. He said, I would rather take the cotton seed and throw it in the river than sell it to you for that price. And this guy didn't like being talked to that way by, by a black man. So he hit him, and Crawford hits him back. And certainly after that, Crawford is arrested, 1916, some pretty rough days. Crawford is arrested. A crowd forms hearing that he has sassed a white man, comes to the courthouse, breaks him out of jail, takes him out, shoots his body hundreds of times, hangs it up on a pole for people to see. They lynch him out in front of the courthouse square. They chase his family out of town. A month later, in early November, his family writes a letter to the governor of South Carolina said, you know, we re really like to come back and get our crops. We had crops in the field. And, uh, the, you know, 400 acres of land, crops in the field, we want it back. The governor said, we can't guarantee your safety. And so they basically, you know, had to flee for their lives and, and go whatever. So here on October the 21st of 2016, 100 years later, we reassembled in Abbeville, South Carolina, first in Jefferson Davis Park. Je <laughs> Abbeville is the place where, the, uh, where Jefferson Davis signed the papers to dissolve the Confederacy after the war. It's also where they had earlier, before the war, agreed on firing on Fort Sumter. That, was, that, that happened there, too. So Abbeville, a little tiny place, but very historic. Uh, here, 100 years later, we reassemble. His family came back to town, and they're not scared anymore. And they want the 400 and some acres of land back, and there's a plaque that has been put in front of the uh, courthouse that describes the situation and the condition of the lynching. And there were several members of the local city council that came out to talk about how they're glad that this, this wrong that Abbeville had been involved in is finally being addressed. And hundreds of people came down there, including students from Ohio and from Clemson University. And I got a chance to play, uh, play hymns on a diddly bow out in front of the courthouse square. Um, but it's like, you know, the, 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 the moral arc of history is long, and so it took 100 years. But that family is back. We've got to understand that I'm working in Greensboro on a project with a grocery store. And there was a community that had its grocery store closed in 1998. And following the closing of that store, they looked for developers and tried to find corporate stores to come back in because this hub for the community had gone away and it left the little shopping center in it in, in disrepair and disarray and the community was demoralized around it. But they got organized and fought against a landfill and fought some other things. And so when I went to talk to some of them about the possibility of starting their own store five years ago, they had moved to now, uh, last weekend we had the grand opening of the Renaissance Cooperative Communities uh, Grocery Store in Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> which is a, a two and a half million dollar project, but folks, you know, it's just beautiful to walk into a store and have the people who work there say, you know, this is the best job I ever had in my life. I love this place. This is the first time I've ever wake up every morning excited and eager to come to work. And where a young man who had been previously incarcerated and couldn't find a job is working there now, and he told his mother, you know, they gave me a chance. I hope I work here for the rest of my life. Uh, and that people are smiling and happy when they, when they greet you coming in. And they got tattoos all over and piercings all over. And, and uh, uh, I mean, all kinds of folk just out of that community are the ones who work there. And the people coming in saying, yeah, this is a dream come true. This is something we dreamed about. It took 18 years for that dream. Now, at the same time, it's only been five years from the Occupy movement in the United States to Donald Trump getting elected president. That's five years. Uh, 
Go figure. I mean, it's kind of hard to understand all the dynamics of the things that take place, but I want, to un want you to understand that the time span or how long it takes to make transformative change can be whatever it is, and our job is to live with integrity and work within the structures and fight as hard as we know how for the people that we love and care about. I have a friend, a young friend, who says, not supposed to take this long. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, y'all were fighting for stuff, and now we still have to fight. And it, you know, it shouldn't take this long. It'll all be over by now. I said, well, it takes as long as it takes. I mean, he said, well, the other people must not have fought hard enough. I said, well, they fought as hard as they knew how. He said, but it wasn't, it wasn't hard enough. I said, and you, you know better how to fight? And he said, well, I, I, I'm going to try to. I said, that's all you can do. And that's what everybody else did. And it just wasn't supposed, I, you know, there's no book that has a schedule for the stuff written down in it that is being violated. Quite frankly, it isn't. And we have to do what we have to do in order to change the world and make it what we want it to be. And in particular, I want us to think about who we're doing it for. Because, I mean, on the one hand, it's for ourselves. Uh, on the other hand, it's for those who are gone now, but on whose shoulders we stand. And we have a certain responsibility for the sacrifices that they made. On the other hand, it's for those who are gone now to whom we have made promises. And some of y'all know what you promised your mama. You, you know you did. You told her that you were going to be the person that she wanted you to be. Uh, and your grandmother and your uncles and the other folks that you cared about and who cared about you, you've made promises. And part of your life now is living out those promises. But in addition to those who are gone for whom we need to stay connected, to whom we need to stay connected, they are the children who we are nurturing and raising and educating and inculcating into, into our culture and into our community, that our work is about them. And it's also for those children yet to be born who will never meet us, who will sometime in the future look back and realize that we are the shoulders on which they stand. And all four of these groups of people are, in fact, what anchors us to community. So the community isn't just what we see around us right now, the people, the buildings, whatever it is. But it is also all of these ties into the past and into the future and the particular role and situation that we play in it right now that leaves us with these enormous responsibilities to do what we need to do to take the weight of changing the world on and realize that the world is dynamically changing and that we have a responsibility within that dynamic changing world to identify every opportunity that comes to be made available and to realize that we can't lose. Thank you very much. things I wanted to talk about. No, we're going to have some questions in a minute, but I want to seed the room with another question so I can get in some arguments with people. Because I'm standing up here, I, I want to tell you why I'm against the guaranteed income. You want to hear it? Okay. There's a story I heard when I was working on a truth and reconciliation project in Greensboro, North Carolina, several years ago. This guy named Bugani Finca from South Africa who came over. And he shared the story about some of the truth and reconciliation hearings that had taken place in the initial truth system in, in um, South Africa. And he said there was, a, there was an old farmer named Thabo. And Thabo had had a confrontation with a man some years ago, Mr. Smith, who had taken his cow. And so they had this reconciliation meeting. And they get together. And Mr. Smith comes in and he says, Thabo, I took your cow. I realize now that I took something that was very valuable to you and that you used it to take care of your family and all. And I understand now that it was wrong. I didn't understand this at the time, but it was wrong and I want to apologize. And I really care about you and I'm sorry. And Tabo was moved by this. It was like, wow, this guy that took my cow is here to apologize and is talking to me about how he wished you know, he hadn't done it. And that's really, really good. So Mr. Smith says, so they, they, they embrace, they hug. Okay, I think they even prayed together, I'm not sure. But they embraced, and so Mr. Smith is getting ready to walk out the room, so Tabo goes, wait. Smith turns around and says, yes, what? He said, what about the cow? <laughs> and, and Smith goes, 
This has got nothing to do with the cow. You are ruining our reconciliation. And then Smith might have, I'm add a little to this, Smith might have looked at him and offered, but I'll tell you what I can do. I can give you a supply of butter, to which Tabo would have needed to respond, if you give me back my damn cow, I can give you butter. All right? The question of reparations, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> it's on my hat. The question of reparations, I think, becomes a framework that stands at some level in opposition to the notion of a guaranteed income. Because if you were to give us back that which we need that has been stolen from us so that we can be fully productive, then we can pass out some extra income. So I don't want a supply of butter. I want the cow back. And that's why I think that this whole discussion around a guaranteed income that tries to solve this problem we, we described, which is a problem that is connected with ownership and production, it tries to solve it without transforming ownership, without transforming production, only by enabling consumption, which at some point eases the burden of these folks who overproduce and can't unload it. So I just want to let you all know why I personally don't think that much about guaranteed income, because I want the cow back. OK, now we can do Q&A. So you don't believe in like cash reparations, you believe in like capital reparations, or can you like elaborate on that a little bit more? To me, the injury that is being repaired and the kind of reparations I would envision um, was a collective injury to a community, to many communities who were robbed of their capacity to accumulate the product of their own labor. Um, and I think that the solution to that needs to be a collective solution that re-enables those communities to be fully productive. Not an, uh, <laughs> let me tell you what happened to the individual cash payment. Nike, Reebok, who come out with their liberation sneakers. Cadillac would have its liberation spinners for, for a car that only cost twice what they normally did. And there would be a temporary bump in the economy where a lot of money gets spent and productive relations would not change, and communities would not be enabled much more to meet their needs and elevate the quality of life. Because again, we live in a consumerist economy, and that's what people are. I think that it's really, really important to make available, think of this commons metaphor, that if there's a commons, you don't want to open it up and invite everybody to come and take, grab some dirt out of it and take it home. You want the commons to be available for the community to use to meet its needs. It's not available to be consumed. You don't want to use it up. You don't want to take it away. You want it available to be used, and it is that type of financing in communities that needs to be broadly available. So right now I'm working with a group that are building the Southern Reparations Loan Fund, which will be a revolving loan fund for the purpose of funding communities and groups that no legitimate lending institution would dream of making loan funds available to. Where the key is gonna be maximizing community benefit rather than maximizing profit. That where it's gonna be radically inclusive. And, uh, and where it's gonna be non-extractive in its nature so that nobody is made worse for having tried to do something, even if that's something they tried to do fail. So that's the, those are the fundamental features of the Southern Reparation Loan Fund as part of a financial cooperative that we're building nationally. But I think there's something along those lines of making finance available to communities for the purpose of development is how we can actually repair damage that again damages the entire development of the community. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, that public education has failed. Uh, how would you suggest that public education be uh, amended to promote opportunities of cooperation and challenges that you mentioned. Has anyone here ever heard of a Samba school? Samba, S-A-M-B-A school. Um, in Brazil, leading up to Carnival, there are these Samba schools where young, f actually they're year round <laughs> because it takes a whole year to lead up to the next Carnival, um, where young people and old people come together and practice new beats and work on costumes and talk to each other and interact. It's intergenerational, uh, it's exciting, it's fun. People are there because they want to be. 
and people learn out, out, out of it. Almost all of us did some of our most complex learning before we ever went to school. And then we go to school and find situations that sap from us uh, our enthusiasm for learning um, out of, of some prescribed rote course that you're supposed to follow as though everybody is supposed to end up being the same. So you have the uniform courses of study that are uniformly bad, I think. Um, so what I would propose is complex. One, one of the things I've realized, years ago I used to do a lot of work on school reform, and then I gave up. I, I, I flat gave it up, because it's like, oh, you can't actually <laughs> fix this. So what I, what, I, what I do believe is that new communities that come into existence need to take up the challenge of new ways of inculcating young people with the tools that are required for building the future of their community. And it won't look very much like what we have right now. Because that's, while that's what it pretends to do, that the existing school system is a, a system of, of indoctrination and dumbing people down, where actual critical thought and kind of critical analysis of things are not encouraged because it tells so many lies that if you engage in critical thought, you would be telling them every day that y'all just lying. I mean, <laughs> it's like Columbus discovered America. That sounds like an early colonialist imperialist project. Is, that, is it even right to do that to people? That's what, some, that's what little kids ought to be asked. We have a history that is so terrible that you would dare not teach it to children. I don't I mean, how old should you be to hear about the rapes that characterize the founding of this country? You know, so no, it needs to, it needs to really look different. But, but fundamentally, I want to talk about the democratic responsibility of us thinking together. That at some point, we need to have serious discussions where we come together and think together and design almost from scratch. What is it that we want young people to know? Because we want them to know enough to fulfill the whole human potential and yet we have a school system that never even discusses what might be the human potential. So, I mean, it's, it's designed not to do what it claims that it's going to be doing. And instead, it dumbs down people dumb enough to do what they did last Tuesday. And I know that doesn't fully answer it, but, but I, don't, I don't think any small group of people have the answer. This is, again, something that the communities of people need to come together and engage in a democratic process that almost never happens uh, in, in regard to existing school systems and school boards. We have to start some new processes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Um, uh, my, my question, I feel like that was a, a much more positive way of addressing my question. Um, and I may be uh, inaccurate in sort of recalling what you had said here, but um, I know you said that, that you, um, you couldn't fight stupid by doing stupid stuff, or, or that you couldn't fight um, what had happened by doing stupid stuff. Um, and I just wanted, uh, or, or um, what your like public education would lead you to do. Um, and I apologize if I'm misquoting that. Um, but I just was hoping that you would clarify on that, just so I can make sure that. Let me tell you something I think is stupid. I think taking on your enemy at the point, huh? You ready for this? I think taking on your enemy at the point of the enemy's strength and your weakness is stupid. Um, so if somebody told me tomorrow that they're getting ready to organize a band of 45 people with sawed-off shotguns and they were going to take on the U.S. Marines, I would tell them that was stupid. All right? And I know people who are almost moved to want to do that because they're angry enough. And I can't blame them for the anger. It's just I don't think that's a good tactic. So once upon a time I was in a demonstration and we were trying to uh, march on Bush. It was connected with the Iraq war. And you know, they were stopped on the road first by the local police who told me I, we couldn't go. And I talked them out of it. And then we got stopped by um, a county sheriff. And I talked them out of it. And then the Secret Service folk came up with somebody in some black pajamas <laughs> and an assault rifle. And I talked them out of it. And by the time I got through talking to them, the guy with the assault rifle said, good luck and thank you, and I walked past. And somebody uh, said, weren't you scared? It's like, no, I would have been scared if I tried to take them on using what they had. I'm approaching them from my point of strength. In fact, I had them at a disadvantage because we were in a discussion. If we'd been in a gunfight, I'd have been in trouble. But we were in an argument, in which case they were at a great disadvantage. 
So I think at every point, we want to identify our strengths and the weakness of the other side and figure out how to move in that kind of way. I'm not going to get into a money slinging contest with Wall Street, all right? That's their point of strength. They got access to way more money right now. That's not what we can do. We have access to people, and we can begin to accumulate money and leverage it in the same ways that other people have done. So it's always about, it's always about identifying points of leverage, identifying fissures and cracks and things, um, figuring out how to split open even a big rock. If you look at it long enough, you can find where the crack is, and that crack is its weak point, the point at which it can be split into two smaller rocks, and they will have cracks in them. You don't want to bludgeon your fist against the solid side of it. It just kind of doesn't make any sense. So that's what I'm talking about, about no, you won't win by doing stupid stuff. And you have to think that through and talk about it and come up with the ways to pit our strength against our enemy's weaknesses. Um, so I guess my question is, um, as someone who, I don't know, I don't like the fact that currently I feel like I'm living in fear um, with my gender, my sexuality, mental illness, these types of things that I know a lot of us are all facing, but I also know that I come from a place of privilege as someone who has a family that supported them, I'm getting a college education, and I am white, and how do we have these dialogues with people who have different kinds of identities and how do we get everyone to come together and then how do we get the people who did you know vote for Trump maybe because we live in a society like you said that isn't meeting their needs how do we meet their needs and yet feel safe to have dialogues with them when, when we feel like they've I mean I don't know I get a little bit of the vibe that they've made a choice to you know persecute us even if that wasn't their intention they're just looking for an escape too and I how do we get those dialogues where we can all come together to Okay, has anyone here ever heard of a group called Song, Southerners on New Ground? Okay, Southern, Song is a, a, a gay and lesbian um, organization in the South that has come together and has done anti-war work. It's done um, uh, other reform work around agriculture, around climate change, around all kinds of stuff. And what they decided to do was that we're going to go to the people who are affected by these things. We're going to tell them who we really are. And we're going to tell them that we care about some of the things that they care about. And they're going to get to know us. Uh, and they have. And in a lot of communities, they have made you know, some real difference in terms of making inroads where people are now saying, wow, you know, I, I didn't know those people at first. Now I do. They, they're, they're people. And they care about what I care about. And quite frankly, most of us don't know what happens late at night when we're <laughs> somewhere else by ourselves in a, or in a room with somebody else. We don't actually know, we don't, and it doesn't make any difference. So our full selves are bigger than, than, than our sexuality, our gender, any of it. And what we have to do is engage and realize that other people's full selves are bigger than and more complex than their racism and the narrow ideas that they have been trained and think they read somewhere in the Bible, except they haven't actually read it. Um, so we have to engage people. I think that we build relationships by working together, and we build trust by keeping promises. And those two things are just so important in terms of what is possible in the world. So some people have taken the idea that the, the kind of work they need to be doing among white working class people is to go to them and tell them repeatedly how racist they are and how it's wrong for them to be racist. And my guess is that this is probably not a winning strategy. <laughs> because unless they already agree with you, they don't want to hear it. On the other hand, their children get hungry when they don't have enough to eat. Um, they get cancer when the mountain tops have been blown off and the heavy metals have polluted the water that, that they're drinking every day. Um, they have insecurity of knowing how they're going to live when they don't have access to jobs or groceries or, or good housing. And it strikes me that a part of what people have to do is to work with folks around what they actually need, in the course of which we will build relationships and we will build trust. And uh, you know, it's like recognizing 
their full humanity as you recognize your own that will be a part of the job that we have to do. And I understand that that is challenging. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. When I was eight years old, there were racists out in the street in Little Rock, Arkansas chanting 2468, we don't want to integrate, kicking people in the belly, about to lynch folk right there in the street in front of the high school I graduated from 10 years later in 1967. All right? Uh, and Little Rock isn't an ideal, wonderful place yet, but it's a place where certainly some of those relationships that were blatant and open then have transformed and are not open. Um, there are some blatant, open, unrepentant racists walking around saying things, some of which they believe, some of which they don't. There are some other people who are not at all like that, but who also voted for the idiot running for president um, on the basis of, well, at least he says he's going to change things. And he basically, the point they make, he's not one of the pointy-headed pointy intellectual elites. Um, and we got to, at some point, realize that what other people refer to as pointy-headed intellectual elites, in spite of the fact that that may be many of us in this room, um, have not had the answer to solve the problems of this country, which will be solved by masses of people taking control over the resources they, that they need in order to provide for their own lives. And that's a, that's a solution that is not coming out of the academy, that's not coming out of the liberal intellectual, uh, liberal establishment. That's the idea that we have, and we have to promote, and we have to promote it everywhere. So when people are looking for who's saying that, it'll be us, all right? And when that crisis deepens, and folk are looking around like, well, what can work? They will see our cooperatives working better than the private things that they see. And they'll say, this is what we want to be a part of. So you all, the folk here in this room, are core of making that happen and making that new possibility real in people's minds as situations continue to get worse. I was on the airplane flying here, and there was a guy sitting in the seat next to me. I always strike up conversations with people. It turns out he does HR for the automobile companies. He's in human relations, so he negotiates contracts with unions now. And I asked him how things were going. You know, I didn't bristle and say, oh, I'm with the other side. I did tell him I was on the other side of the table, but we had a good conversation. But he basically said, he said, you know, the day of the 75 cent, 50 cent raise is over. He said the day of real pension, of a defined benefit pension plan is over. He said the, uh, the days of good health care that are paid for by the company, they're just over. And people are more and more realizing that. And particularly, he said, a lot of millennials don't even expect that anymore. And it's only people who are older that even know what a defined benefit pension plan is because they almost don't exist anymore. I said, well, all of these things sound like they're getting worse and worse. How much worse can things continue to get and, and, and something won't happen? And he goes, I, I don't know, but if you can either pay $16, $18 an hour in the United States for manufacturing or $6 a day somewhere else, you know, what you gonna do? Yeah, that's right, yeah, because if people own everything that we need in order to provide for ourselves, and they can take that ownership, that value, and employ it anywhere in the world, and that doesn't mean them paying higher wages here. He said, but what happens after a while is they start out paying them $6 a day, and then that stuff gets more and more organized, and wants more and more, and it has to move. And they can play that game for a fairly long time. So uh, that's the situation we're in. A lot of things are getting worse, and so we have to be able to take that truth and talk about the fact that the answer doesn't lie in the established ways that people have approached it, but it lies in what we're talking about. Thank you, um, Ed. Um, so, you know, so you, you were talking earlier about, um, you know, loan frameworks that, you know, are intended to be intentional uh, toward building a cooperative um, community, um, worker cooperatives, et cetera. Um, I, I was in a workshop last year with a woman who did a lot of farming worker cooperatives um, and was talking about um, how, you know, she would get these community folks together to, to do like a worker cooperative, but a challenge became when there was a disagreement uh, when there, or about how to move forward or, um, you know, what, what have you, that there was a tendency to deal with that disagreement or to deal with that difference in the same way we see a lot of corporations do it with, um, you know, hostile takeovers of boards and, and uh, you know, trying to push certain people out. Um, and it led her into doing more deeper work around TANDIS and saving circles, you know, TANDIS as it's referred to in Latin America. Um, and so I'm just wondering about your thoughts on the notion of a saving circle or, or those types of practices as a way to kind of build capacity on a cultural level for people to have confidence 
in making decisions collectively? And is that even really possible among working people who often aren't, don't have the ability to save? I like saving circles. I think they're a great idea. I think people uh, should be encouraged to form them. I also don't think that there is a single path to getting done what we need to do. So I think that that will be part of one of the paths toward it. I think that some other people are able to build worker cooperatives that are effective. I think in every one of them, every, any kind of cooperative you build, you're going to have to have uh, methods of conflict resolution to resolve the kind of contradictions that naturally emerge among people who are not all born in exactly the same spot of time, place, and situation, and therefore have different understandings of the world. So that we have to, our challenge is figuring out how to build democracy. The biggest challenge we have is how to make democracy work. How do we make it so that people can together decide the things that are important to them? That's the biggest challenge. It's an organizing challenge. And once we can match up with that organizing challenge, we will be able to build power. So the, one, the approach you're talking about is definitely an approach. Capacity building has to be a conscious and intentional part of almost everything that we do. And, and I would more caution people to be observant and creative rather than to give people a particular thing that they all needed to do. Because I think in the course of that creativity, we're going to, through a pluralistic kind of way, discover that there are a number of things that will work in addition to a number of things that won't. And uh, we will be able to weed that out and take those as the, as the continued learnings that we're able to pass on to others. Power imbalances exist because people have different levels of access to the tools of power, to the, to the instruments of, uh, of, of power. And we have to also figure out ways that we can balance the level of access to those tools of power through, through education, uh, through all of the ways that, that we have to do it. Um, and it's a challenge. It's, it's not easy. I mean, if it was going to be easy, life would be boring. But it's not. Life will not be boring anytime in the near future. That's my prediction. Thank you. <laughs>